Um, we're going to spend a few minutes today just talking about our adventures and using Argo workflows to run the CI for Argo workflows. Um, before we dive in, just to introduce ourselves, uh, my name's Tim. I'm the infrastructure guy at Pipekit. Um, I spend quite a lot of my time in the CNCF Slack answering your Argo questions. Uh, I'm also part of the Argo Helm team, delivering the Helm charts for all of the Argo projects. Uh, hi, I'm Denise Shannon. I'm the VP of Engineering at Loft Labs. Um, as an engineer, I didn't actually make any of my slides, just to let you know. Didn't design them. I know the content, but... So just a bit about PipeKit. Um, we're a group of Argo maintainers and experts. Uh, we regularly contribute to Argo workflows as well as other Argo and open source projects. Um, so if you invest in PipeKit, you're investing in Argo. Um, happy days. Um, we provide an enterprise control plane for Argo workflows. Uh, it makes your RBAC life easier, lets you trigger runs through Git with minimal config, um, and lets you view and run your workflows across multiple clusters. Um, also, if you're in need of an SLA on your open source uh, Argo installation, um, and you want, or you want something like deeper support in that, um, we're happy to help. Um, so Loft Labs is the creator of several open source projects, includes vCluster, DevPod, DevSpace, JS Policy. Across our projects, we have a lot of GitHub stars, an active Slack community. Earlier this year, we raised our Series A round, and currently we're at a size of uh, 50, I think we just hit, and growing. So why do we want to do the whole dog fooding thing? Um, so in my opinionated opinion, um, the developer experience of the upstream Argo CI um, isn't great um, and could be improved. Um, so if you make a fork of the upstream CI, uh, of the upstream, sorry, uh, upstream Argo workflows repo, uh, you see that the GitHub Actions CI doesn't run on your fork. Um, that leads you to either pick and choose which end-to-end -end test you want to run locally, manually, while you're doing your development. Um, you could wait until you've pushed your change all the way upstream, and then you can really annoy some Argo maintainer by doing a load of back and forth with them. Um, or you can adjust the GitHub actions to make them run on your fork, but then you've got this kind of weird problem where you have to undo your adjustments to push the change up to upstream, and it's, it's just messy. Um, so each of those options has its drawbacks. Um, secondly, the CI that's up there at the moment doesn't run as you might expect it to run. Um, so the CI does build container images um, and then doesn't use them for the end-to-end -end tests. Um, it just puts them to the side and then runs binaries instead. And lastly, we at PipeKit know that Argo Workflows is great for CI. We use it for CI internally. We have customers that use it for CI. Um, so it feels kind of fitting that we should do this and prove that Workflows can run CI for itself. So we set ourselves some kind of high-level goals and boundaries for this project. Um, we obviously wanted to use Argo workflows to run the CI, um, but we wanted to run all the things that the CI up there currently runs. We wanted to leave the tests alone. In theory, the tests are solid, and they should run with whatever framework you wrap around them. We wanted to keep our workflows manifest in a separate repo um, from uh, the, the main repo that we're forking, just to give us that ability to, to push the changes back quickly and manage the, the framework separately. Obviously, we wanted to run as fast as we can, but reliably so. And lastly, we only wanted to use open source tools to, to complete this project so that we can then give this to other companies and projects in the longer term. So let's have a look at the existing upstream CI. Um, First, there's a load of things that I'm just not showing you, um, frankly, because they're quite boring. Um, so there's unit testing, linting, code checks, all that sort of stuff. And they were really easy to port across from GitHub Actions to Argo Workflows. Um, there's a kind of one-to-one -one mapping, really, of you know, unit tests are a logical block that you just move into a workflow step. So I just didn't bother. Um, but on the slightly trickier level, it's probably worth noting that there are some Windows unit tests upstream. Um, so if we wanted to run that, or if we want to run that in Argo workflows, we need Windows Kubernetes nodes and all the fun that comes with that. Um, it actually wasn't too difficult for us to add Windows nodes to our EKS cluster to get that working. Um, and I guess just in case you didn't know, Argo workflows does run absolutely fine on Windows, as, as fine as anything runs on Windows. Um, <laughs> the trickiest part really came with the end-to-end -end tests or E2E -E tests as they're called in the upstream EI, uh, CI, kind of interchangeably. And here's how they operate. 
Um, so GitHub Actions builds just plain Argo binaries for the end-to-end -end tests, and they sit outside of a Kubernetes cluster. And then using magic, um, they talk to the Kubernetes cluster, and the actual cluster runs the tests themselves. The binaries themselves have full admin permissions to the Kubernetes cluster, so RBAC is basically ignored in those tests, um, which is slightly concerning. Um, and then when the actual tests are run, the end-to-end -end tests are run, they are grouped into 10 logical groups of tests. Um, each of those tests has a Kubernetes cluster. So there's 10 K3D clusters in that mix. There's 10 workflow controller binaries running, et cetera, et cetera. Um, each group of tests has a very slightly different dependency setup. Um, so they might, they, they look largely the same, but there are some slight nuances between them. If you're running the test locally, you only get one Kubernetes cluster, and then you have to run what you want to run in series, so it takes a lot longer. And finally, there's, there's a handful of third-party tools added to the mix um, inside your Kubernetes clusters. Um, so there's MinIO for artifact things and MySQL for databasey things. Um, and there's a few other things in there that just uh, aren't really worth mentioning today. So then here is our desired state for our end-to-end -end tests. So firstly, we would have a pre-existing Argo workflows installation that builds Argo images, pushes them to a registry. And secondly, a workflow step acts as a test runner executing the same make commands that GitHub Actions would run, this time installing the controller and server pods inside the cluster. As a bonus, because they're now inside the cluster, we can do Kubernetes RBAC testing properly, uh, ensure that the test passed with some sort of minimally permissive RBAC setup. Finally, we installed the exact same third-party tools using the exact same manifests um, as before. And luckily for me, most of the hard work uh, was already done upstream. So uh, upstream, the container builds are done. They're just not used. Um, so the container builds are done using BuildKit upstream. You can run BuildKit in a Kubernetes cluster, no problem. You can manage that with Argo workflows, absolutely no problem. Um, to trigger the tests, I just need a workflow step with make installed, and I can run the same make commands that the GitHub Actions runs. All of the required Kubernetes manifests, so MinIO, uh, Argo workflows even, uh, all available upstream. Um, so I can just steal them, put them into my cluster, and pretend, uh, excuse me, and pretend I worked really hard. So at this point, the biggest hurdle is how do we scale? How do we get those 10 Kubernetes clusters, each with all the prerequisites and our freshly built container images installed into them? Um, how can I interact with all the installed Argo workflows using make to get them to run the tests. Um, so to get those 10 identical clusters, I could sit there with some Terraform or OpenTofu or CloudFormation if I want to make my life really difficult um, to spin up 10 new EKS clusters. My boss would have a small heart attack at the end of the month because of the cost. Um, and we're probably looking at, generously, an additional 30 minutes waiting for those clusters to start up. Or, um, as luck would have it, I'm doing this talk with Denise from Loft, and so you've probably guessed the solution already. Okay, so we obviously use vCluster. So what is vCluster? So vCluster started in 2021 and essentially allows you to create virtual Kubernetes clusters. In fact, it's the only certified Kubernetes distro for creating virtual Kubernetes clusters, and it's open source. So right now we have over 6,500 people starting it in GitHub. If you want to check it out yourself, feel free to go to our GitHub link or vcluster.com. So at its core, vcluster allows you to create secure multi-tenancy for Kubernetes. Let's first talk about how companies tend to usually hand out Kubernetes clusters. Whenever anyone needs a cluster, like in our example, you'd have to figure out, let's provision 10 separate Kubernetes clusters. At first, that seems simple enough to keep up with, but slowly over time, we know that each additional cluster is more time and money spent, as Tim has been talking about. Now, the alternative that companies often use is they might want to try and save money with multi-tenancy in Kubernetes, and that default way today is usually to hand out namespaces in the same cluster. The downside of this approach is that it's not truly secure as tenants share cluster-wide resources, which can quickly create conflicts. For example, if different tenants wanted to test out different versions of the same CRD, sharing namespaces wouldn't be possible, and their only solution would be to get their own independent cluster. So how is vCluster different? With vCluster, you're able to truly isolate the tenants. First, we start off with a Kubernetes cluster that we refer to as a host cluster. Running vCluster is nothing more than deploying a pod onto that host cluster. 
In that pod, vCluster runs a Kubernetes control plane, and you make it available via a load balancer, ingress, et cetera, and the tenant talks directly to the vCluster's control plane. There's no longer competition or conflict between the tenants since they are truly isolated from each other, and they're talking directly to their own distinct control planes, all while using the same underlying host cluster. In that example I mentioned earlier, where multiple tenants want to test out different versions of the same CRD, they now can do that using vCluster and still share the same host cluster. Their CRDs would be deployed into their individual control planes, and there would be no conflict on the host cluster. Another benefit of vCluster is that once you have your host cluster available, it's easy to quickly provision more virtual clusters since deploying a vCluster is nothing, nothing more than deploying another pod. Now it's obvious we can immediately save costs in physical infrastructure with vCluster, but there are even more ways that you can stack your cost savings. By having one host cluster, you can deploy what we call a shared platform stack that allows you to deploy applications and CRDs into the host cluster, but be able to use those applications across all your virtual clusters without needing to redeploy them into every single cluster that you have. In addition to these benefits, we also have the ability to put your vCluster and workloads to sleep when they're not in use in order to save on resource usage costs. So to summarize, why did we use vCluster in this challenge? So in our example, we had 10 different Argo workflows that we wanted to test out and be able to test them with true Kubernetes RBAC. In, or, in order to mimic the real world use, we would have required 10 individual clusters. And the reason why we chose it was we now only needed one host cluster. It's open source. It's a certified Kubernetes distro. And each Kubernetes cluster is isolated from each other. So we could easily run our 10 workflows in parallel. Overall, it saved us a lot of time and money. So it's slightly anticlimactic, but we did the thing. Um, with vCluster in the mix, we achieved what we set out to do. Uh, we added a workflow step that span up the 10 vClusters, as Denise just said. We connected to them within a minute, uh, installed the dependencies and everything we wanted to test, and then the test ran. Once the tests were complete, we had a workflows exit handler just to tear down the vClusters. So in terms of runtime, uh, we're comparable with upstream CI, uh, slightly quicker if you're feeling generous. Um, and of course, this is definitely faster than running locally. In terms of cost, um, it's never going to defeat free. Um, we were running AWS on-demand nodes, um, AMC, AMD64 nodes, uh, with GP3 storage. So it works out about $2.5 per run. Um, I'm pretty confident we could halve that with a bit more effort, um, but that's where we're at right now. So all that is at least hopefully, mildly interesting, um, but probably not super useful in terms of what you're doing in your day-to-day. -day. Um, so I want to take a few minutes just to break down some of the challenges and the decisions we made along the way, which hopefully kind of helps you in your, your CI-ish journey with Argo. Um, this slide in particular is quite clicky, um, with loads of links to various helpful places. Um, you can download the slide deck. There's a link a little bit later. Um, it's on Ched and all that sort of stuff as well, if, if that's what you want to do. Um, so anyway, just to highlight a few of the things on this slide, um, we opted to use an NFS share to pass data between workflow steps rather than using the artifacts that are sort of the default method of doing that within workflows. Um, in the majority of cases, I believe this is quite a lot cheaper and quite a lot faster um, for this sort of in-workflow transient data management. Um, I did a talk making my case on, the, on this a couple of years back, so that's where that first link goes. Um, as I mentioned, the upstream tests don't really consider Kubernetes RBAC, um, so we had to add our own in and, and make our own stuff up. Um, the big thing to be aware of in terms of workflows RBAC in general um, is that you really need to uh, allow the workflow executor to patch workflow task results. If you don't, your workflow will just hang in weird places and it's really confusing. If you come here today wanting to know why your workflows are hanging, that's why. Um, you're welcome, you can go home. We had to teach our cluster auto-scaling uh, not to terminate nodes that were being used, run, uh, being used throughout the tests. So if a test pod is removed when it's running, all the tests just instantly fail. Um, so that more or less forced us to use those on-demand instances, which is what's um, spiking the cost of our CI jobs at the moment. Um, we would obviously prefer to use spot instances, but spot instances can be terminated in very short notice. So. I would really like to put the effort in over time to teach the framework that retries are fine and should be embraced and, and all that sort of stuff. And then we could lower the cost that way. Um, if you are starting, in, starting out in some sort of cloud-native CI CD journey, even if it's not going to be Argo in the end, 
definitely embrace spot instances. You will save a ton of money. Um, yeah, definitely do it. Um, when we first started building out this test framework and, and running it, um, we, we started hitting all sorts of weird alerts in our alerting system, specifically this contract error. Um, the error itself isn't important. Um, what I really want to try and emphasize is that you need some sort of solid observability solution in your system, um, in your cluster, before you start messing around with Argo workflows or, or anything of that sort of scale in, in your cluster. Um, without this, I could have taken our cluster offline for probably some time and not really understood why for a very long period of time um, if I didn't have that kind of observability stack there. Um, if you don't have any Argo workflows observability at the moment, I do appreciate that the whole observability thing sounds quite daunting. Um, at Pipekit, we have a completely free work, uh, workflow metrics offering um, that gives you a no config look into the health of your workflows. Um, there's no strings, you can just sign up, use it, you can just see those metrics almost immediately. Um, similarly, this whole work emphasized the importance of a cluster-wide logging solution. Um, it was really helpful to have a single view of logs into each of those workflow controllers, each of those V clusters, every single pod, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Argo Workflows does come with a log archiving solution, and even the Argo Workflows docs tell you not to use it for production, so don't. Um, it doesn't archive everything. It is quite expensive in terms of the log compression and all that sort of stuff, and the search is poor. Um, it is really worth you putting the effort into a more dedicated cluster-wide logging solution. Um, I'm more than happy to have a conversation with you about that. There's loads of options there. So um, yeah, come and find me at some point. Um, Docker Hub was a real problem for us. Um, a lot of the tests use Alpine or uh, they were using Whale, say. Um, there's a few other things in there. Um, and each of them pull from Docker Hub by default. And, and Docker Hub is quite strict on how much allocation they'll let you pull before they start to stop letting you pull, basically. Um, there's a number of solutions to that problem. You could mix and match them. So you could patch in an image pull secret into all those places that you need one, so that you get, you can do that for free still with, a, with some sort of GitHub, uh, Docker Hub authentication. You could introduce a local pull through cache, like ECR, something like that. Um, we use a tool called Spiegel that automatically caches pulls in your cluster across nodes. So if a node over there has already pulled the image, the node over here can just pull it internally without having to bother the querying um, Docker Hub. Lastly, to ensure a reliable cleanup once the tests were finished, we made use of Argo's exit handlers, um, but we also use a tool called Cube Janitor. So Cube Janitor allows you to set a TTL annotation on things in your cluster, and when the TTL has, has been reached, Cube Janitor comes along and cleans it up. Um, so it's a great belt and braces solution to if, you, if your exit handler doesn't fire properly and you've written bad YAML like I always do, um, you know, you've got something there to clean up those V clusters and all the associated things um, just to keep everything clean and everything as cheap as possible. So in terms of bumps in the road we found uh, with the upstream tests and the setup, um, the YAML manifests that I stole have no persistence and they have no resource requests set. That's sort of fine-ish for uh, local testing because um, you're probably only using like a single node cluster. Uh, you're not going to be using it for anything else. Um, I was being brave and I was using our internal CI cluster um, while all the developers were also using the same cluster to do actual work. Um, and so that could have gone bad. Um, so to fix the underlying problem, we needed to add resource requests um, appropriately everywhere in all of those uh, manifests, basically. Otherwise, the cube scheduler just tries to put far too much stuff onto a single node. Um, we also set some default resource requests in the workflow controller config map inside each vCluster so that there were some guaranteed resources for every single um, test step as well. Similarly, things like min.io and MySQL, um, those manifests from upstream also have none of that stuff set. Um, they became much more reliable once we added things like PVCs for storage, rather than hoping that everything would just stay in memory for the duration of the tests, which they didn't. Um, in terms of what you can learn from this, uh, it really does pay to set appropriate resource requests on everything in your cluster. So that's not just workflow stuff, but that is everything. And it's painstaking and it's dull and yeah, I get it, but it really does pay off. Um, in terms of like cluster efficiency and workflow reliability. By running the tests through Argo workflows rather than through the GitHub Actions, we actually found a number of test cases that were failing in our environment, um, but not upstream. 
So we caught and fixed a reasonably serious work, uh, Argo 3.6 issue before 3.6 got released um, that probably wouldn't have been found um, unless we'd done this. We also found some flaky tests along the way. So the tests had things like hard-coded timeouts uh, rather than checking the cluster for a state change or something like that. Um, and some tests were designed to work in a kind of not real cluster environment rather than we were essentially running the tests in EKS, um, and so bad things happened. Um, we have pushed fixes for most of them already, um, with some more fixes on the way, hopefully. So where next? Um, we really want to open source the work we've done. Um, what we've done is pretty messy and very customized to our setup, um, which is why I haven't just plastered a massive QR code or something like that here. Um, but there's no secret if you want to see my mess. Um, give me a shout and I'll email it to you. It's, it's not a problem. Um, my bigger dream for this is that it becomes the default, the, the kind of de facto CI um, for Argo workflows. Um, we are some way off achieving this at the moment. Um, definitely need more work. We need to improve the CI. We need to improve the test suite, the cost, the speed. Um, and I guess more importantly, we need to persuade someone to actually host the, the thing. Um, but one of the reasons I wanted to talk about this today is just to gauge community interest. So if you're interested in getting involved in that kind of project, then yeah, just give me a shout and we'll, we'll see what we can put together. That's it. Thanks for listening. Um, so the talk slides are on that first, that top left link up there. Um, if you want to use the free observability tool I was talking about, that's the middle left link. Um, if you want kind of general Argo help, um, do come by our booth. We'd love chatting with you about open sourcey stuff and all that kind of thing. Um, if you don't like face-to-face -face or human interaction and that sort of stuff, um, we do as the, exactly the same thing on Zoom regularly as well. So there's a, there's a Zoom link there if you want that. Um, lastly, if you come and find me over the next few days, I do have some limited edition kind of uh, workflows, dog fooding um, swag. It's not dog food. Um, so yeah, <laughs> come and find me. Yeah, and uh, if you'd like to check out vCluster, you can head to our install link, learn more about how to deploy it. We're also on the booth floor. You can come find me, booth A6, I think is where we are. So yeah, thanks for coming. Yeah. All right, we, yeah, so we have time for a few questions. Yes, yeah, so there's one right here. I'm sorry, it's just a real quick question. Can you put back up, you said to reach out if we wanted to uh, learn more or work with you on that, uh, but you went by too quick with how to contact you. So can you either throw that slide back up real quick or shut yeah, it out? Yeah, it's not actually on the slide. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we don't actually want you to contact us, that's what he's saying. Your best bet is to find us on the booth. Um, and we'll have a chat there. Um, or pipekit.io, there's loads of ways to contact us through that. Um, that's probably the best way. Thank you. All right. Yeah, so hi. So you talked about the vCluster stuff. How do you manage like resources? I know you can just add a pod to create a new cluster, but eventually you're going to run out of resources there, or does it just spin up new pods in the, in the hosting cluster? How, how do you manage that piece for costing? There's, I think there's resource limits on the vCluster pod itself. So I mean, you. It's like any Kubernetes cluster where you have to kind of manage how many pods you have running on it. So vCluster is no different. So vCluster specifically, the way vCluster works is it only syncs down in your virtual Kubernetes cluster, it only syncs down to the host cluster, the actual resources that need to be exposed. So pods, services. And so there's, that's how you can save on resources in, in, to begin with because it never actually goes to the host cluster to begin with. Gang, y'all crushed that presentation. It was excellent. Um, one question I had was within the um, cluster architecture, it looked like, or, or you have the ab ability to define like shared resources that are installed like at the global level. Is that where the Argo server and the workflow controller was installed or did you do it in each v We have to well? do it in each okay. because they are slightly, the slight differences between all of those setups for various reasons, you know, they're testing different things you know there's a bunch of database tests there's a bunch of artifact tests for example and so the the config of each is ever so slightly different so we couldn't use that shared model unfortunately in this case but we talked about All right. it uh, time for one more question here so 
I must have missed it. One of the original problems you were trying to solve was enabling forks to run tests. How did how did y'all through this solution and stuff enable that? Yeah, I did gloss over that. Um, so we internally use PipeKit to do a lot of the, the glue for that. So our fork is linked through PipeKit. Uh, PipeKit acts as effectively the same thing that Argo events would do in terms of uh, your, your pull request on your fork would trigger a, the stuff to happen in Argo workflows. Um, in a pure open source environment, you would then use Argo events and to create all that glue, to set all that up. So it isn't as simple as, currently anyway, it's not as simple as make the fork and magic happens. There's, there's make the fork and do some setup. Um, but frankly, the setup was dull, so I didn't talk about it. I'll come talk to you afterwards. That'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Cheers, guys. Thanks.